So while that's coming up, uh, I was asked to come here and, and uh, give you a little overview of what's going on kind of in our local community uh, as UTEP kind of dives in with two feet on the aviation side. Uh, a lot of effort been going on for the last uh, about year and a half, uh, mostly with the School of Engineering. Uh, has looked at both a manned and an unmanned program. Uh, uh, the MAN program will be a four-year flight program just like Purdue or Ohio State. Uh, Dr. Wilson has not yet made the decision to pull the trigger on that one, but on the unmanned side, uh, uh, we've been kind of cocked in, in full afterburner for the last year and a half, and a lot of things going on in this community are unique in the entire country. So a lot of push not only for uh, deconfliction between manned and unmanned, uh, kind of joint operations between manned and unmanned, uh, but a lot of things being established here in our community from a technology standpoint, uh, uh, that focus to try and uh, continue to bring kind of industry into El Paso and create those kind of opportunities for our uh, human capital that we train at UTEP that ends up and just some abjectly brilliant kids that end up leaving El Paso and going to Dallas or Phoenix or Silicon Valley uh, after their education. And really our focus is to keep them here locally. But to do that, we gotta create obviously those technological opportunities uh, and jobs for those students to have uh, the ability to stay here. And a lot of, a lot of uh, movement kind of in that area. This is kind of the team that works together uh, and has worked very closely together over this last year and a half to integrate uh, kind of unmanned systems in our community. It goes across all the federal, state, local, law enforcement and public safety uh, uh, agencies. Uh, and this is unique in the United States. And El Paso is a unique area in that we're sitting right on the border and so these federal agencies uh, work very closely together uh, where typically they do not in other places. One of our issues has been in our airspace is uh, how do you deconflict that manned and unmanned aircraft that's flying every day? As you know, we have DHS, uh, FBI, uh, Texas DPS, and now National Guard has been uh, 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 kind of chopped over to help uh, DHS on some of the stuff that's going along uh, with the border and they're flying low altitude 24 hours a day 365 days a year. Uh, the issue becomes when you're having large numbers of unmanned aircraft flying in the same airspace and especially those that are not following what the rules are because no one's doing the enforcement how do you deconflict those aircraft? And that becomes, that is a big issue for our country and specifically a big issue for El Paso because we have that restricted airspace to the north and everything kind of funnels through over the downtown area. Right now there's only 1.5 million unmanned aircraft and these are the ones that are registered with the FAA. Uh, right now the rate historically has been about 20% of the people follow the law and register the aircraft with the FAA. So you can understand the numbers of, uh, of these uh, uh, aircraft flying in our national airspace. And this is the type of stuff we see uh, often. This is three and a half mile final at McCarran International Airport. Uh, the Frontier Airlines pilot didn't know this happened. The FAA didn't know this happened. They only knew this happened when this video popped up. But we see these types of activities happening kind of all the time. Pretty scary because we all fly on these airliners. Same thing goes with, uh, again, this is not unique to El Paso, not unique to, uh, in fact, the U.S. across the board. And as all of you who have flown and that still fly understand that all the departures are published. So the, one of the main concerns from a Homeland Security perspective is the next 9-11 will be this right here. So if you can put something 3,000 feet to the side and get this great video, you can also move that over and put that down an engine. 
because all of that is very, very scripted on departure for safety reasons, but it also provides on the other side that predictability. And what does it look like when one of these goes into an aircraft engine? <laughs> it is a immediate catastrophic failure of the fan system and the blade containment system. If you remember a year, year and a half ago, Southwest Airlines threw a single blade and that lady was killed on that flight. This is a immediate, uh, the entire containment system fails uh, and all those blades get thrown. So you can understand what the uh, uh, impact of that is. And that's not only, that's just for the engine, but same thing under part 23 and part 25, as aircraft are getting certified, none of them uh, are certified to the standards to withstand uh, very dense batteries or metal pieces to be able to withstand that either on the structure or the uh, uh, cockpit. So this is a big, big issue from that perspective. Along with that, this is very recent, just this year, Kalishnikov, uh, started marketing this capability. Uh, in their marketing, it says uh, very clearly, if you don't like the US, we'd love to sell to you. <laughs> 40 mile range, uh, stealth system, so very low cross section, uh, five pounds of uh, uh, high explosive, uh, completely autonomous. You launch it and you walk away and it guides on a GPS location. So this is the new reality both for a Department of Defense on the defensive side, but also for our Homeland Security uh, uh, in this area. Uh, overseas, uh, UAS is, you know, that has been the domain of the US for decades. Now, these commercial systems are being used uh, uh, very frequently uh, started out uh, significantly in the fight for Mosul, but now it's across the board. And every uh, kind of group that wants to do bad towards the U.S., either deployed forces or those uh, home, this is the type of activities that they're doing. And they're, this is very simple. They're taking uh, uh, either grenades or mortars, flying them with the UAS and just dropping them. This one on the left was, uh, so one on the right is actually they're flying over and targeting specific uh, uh, individuals. Uh, on this side, uh, it was a, actually a Syrian uh, weapon storage dump, and this was ISIS doing the same thing with a mortar. That's a result. Uh, so this is uh, uh, something that uh, the U.S. military is seeing over and over and over. Uh, swarming used to be a U.S. military only kind of capability. This is uh, a couple years old. Uh, the capability to take lots of these onto a target and you take lots of very uh, uh, inexpensive uh, aircraft and even if you had a uh, very high-end uh, 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 search stereo missile system uh, uh, and, and you had 10 or 12 missiles uh, to be able to defend against uh, B-2s or uh, F-35s or F-22s, not a lot of defense against this uh, when you're putting a hundred of these things against. And so it is how kind of warfare is changing from those who don't have the capabilities that countries like the U.S. kind of brings to the uh, uh, table. Yeah. Another area that DEA is very concerned about is Axpray. So now uh, these commercial off-the-shelf capabilities, the capability to uh, dispense uh, 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 pesticides and other for crop growing, guess what happens when you put fentanyl in something like this? So those are the type of uh, uh, things that this technology brings from a threat perspective that again is extremely worrisome. On top of that, from our national airspace, guess what the FAA does a pretty crappy job of? That's tracking what is flying down at low altitude. In fact, in a lot of areas across our country, the FAA has zero capability to see even a manned aircraft down at low altitude. Because that is uncontrolled Class G airspace and the FAA never planned to control anything down at that, below that kind of uh, 1,200 feet. So all of the FAA radars and tracking capabilities for that, you know, kind of 1,200 feet and above, 
but all this activity is going on kind of at this low altitude. So that that is not a capability that our federal government currently has to be able to uh, uh, track. Interestingly, we are the first community uh, that will start to get, we have three, uh, the first three of uh, uh, these low altitude tracking radars are coming in. Uh, first one coming in by, before the end of this year uh, that will be established to do exactly that. And that's that government team that is actually implementing that to be able to track this very low altitude uh, type of uh, activity. We sit on the border uh, and these are, uh, these next two are capabilities that you can go by this afternoon. Commercial off the shelf capabilities that is now uh, uh, what uh, used to be five years ago or 10 years ago was US military only. Now, because that ecosphere is iterating so quickly uh, and is actually catching up to and in some areas surpassing what the military is able to put out because uh, their iteration cycle is a month where the US uh, military and acquisition piece obviously is on a fiscal year kind of cycle, moves very, very slow. But this kind of capability, uh, if you are a criminal organization and you're gonna do something and you wanna make sure there's no police around you, you have now have the capability to do that and ensure that uh, uh, you're safe or if you are trying to get something across the border uh, and you want to make sure you know where all the Border Patrol personnel are, not difficult to do. Uh, and uh, so these type of capabilities from that standpoint uh, get uh, uh, very worrisome from a kind of defense of uh, uh, the United States. So a lot of efforts going on at the Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and then some of the think tanks of how you combat what this new normal is. Uh, we looked at some of the stuff that's going on overseas, but uh, uh, just last year, uh, multiple times where there were drones flown illegally uh, over NFL stadiums during games. Uh, and you start to take a look at uh, uh, those type of opportunities for people that want to do bad, uh, uh, they're extensive. This is, if you wanted, if uh, you were trying to do something bad to El Paso, this is a capability with a 10 pound payload you could go by this afternoon uh, and go fly and deliver something anywhere in that range from south of the border. You no longer have to get something, if you're trying to do something in the U.S., you no longer have to get it across the border, which is very difficult to get through a POE, or because uh, obviously Border Patrol does a very good job of monitoring that. You don't have to do that anymore, because these capabilities give you, or these technologies give you a capability to do that. So a lot of effort in this community on all of these uh, uh, kind of issues uh, uh, that connects not only the uh, government agencies, but uh, UTEP, and we're actually the uh, operational and technical lead for this entire effort. On top of that, uh, we're building a new airport. Uh, so for some of you that fly, you may have seen out in Tornillo, there's a new runway out there. Well. Uh, I wouldn't try landing on that, uh, but that is for unmanned only, uh, and that is a collaboration between Homeland Security and uh, 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 UTEP, but that is a uh, purpose-made uh, unmanned airport uh, that all the government agencies here in our area use uh, uh, for training. That's actually the first place uh, that the radar, uh, the first radar is going out. Uh, one of the follow-ons will actually go out to Santa Teresa uh, also to Im improve the safety. That's what the eventual, the runway's in, the uh, uh, radar facility is in, the rest of the buildings are uh, uh, on the way. Within the uh, uh, system, UTEP already, that's the runway, uh, uh, flies a number of different systems, uh, pretty incredible capabilities. Tough to see, but that one right there, 
will fly from El Paso to Colorado completely autonomously carrying 10 pounds of uh, uh, payload. It is a launch and then it does its own navigation all the way to landing itself. So it does uh, checks the winds, uh, flares, lands, uh, completely autonomously, uh, no human input. So that from a technology standpoint, and those are again uh, undergrad students who, who designed that system. Uh, these right here are actually what are currently being produced for Department of Defense. Uh, again, UTEP students who are uh, uh, doing that, so some pretty unique capabilities about that. Uh, one of the most unique new efforts is uh, we're now, uh, UTEP is the uh, lead university for flight tests for NASA Armstrong at Edwards Air Force Base. So they are the premier flight test uh, 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 organization in the entire world. Uh, and actually some of their, the active flight testing will be done remotely out here in El Paso. Uh, so that's a new, that's not even announced yet, uh, but that is a uh, kind of very new effort. And one of the principal uh, kind of research efforts on that is uh, redefining the aircraft wing. Uh, the, what NASA thinks is every aircraft wing that we have flown with uh, over the last hundred years is wrong, wrong. And we have gotten it wrong since the very beginning. Every uh, airplane wing on every aircraft that's ever flown uh, uh, is a uh, elliptical lift profile. But when you look at nature and you look at brown pelicans and seagulls and other things that fly very long distance and you look at them under a high G turn, guess what you don't see? That wingtip, those feathers are under zero load. That's why they're not deflected in those cases. Uh, so a lot of investigation of why are birds different than everything that men and women have created from an airplane side. Uh, and the result of that uh, uh, has come up with uh, this thing called a Prandtl wing. What's it? A Prandtl. 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 P-R-A-N-D-T-L. Nice. Uh, in this wing, when you do a turn, you don't get adverse yaw you get proverse, y'all. So the first aircraft that no vertical surfaces are required to counteract that adverse yaw. Even the B-2, uh, it has split ailerons that actually cause drag <coughs> on the low wing to overcome that adverse yaw. This one, proverse yaw, <coughs> none of that is required. And UTEP's actually gonna be flying the very first fully 3D printed version of this wing. But NASA's been a lot of time and effort uh, on kind of this concept, which has a chance to fundamentally change how wings are designed and built in the future for every aircraft that's kind of out there. And it's pretty amazing. And it's kind of this, uh, why did it take us a hundred years to figure this out? Uh, and people have been hitting, in fact, Prandtl wrote his first paper in 1928 uh, and another one 1933 and then it disappeared until about 10 years ago when some NASA scientists started to go, we're not understanding why these bird wings, what nature has designed is different than what man has designed and thus started that investigation and that's where we are right now. And he did his work in the 30s. Uh, so his first paper was 28, 1928. 1928. What type of flight control causes it to, to bank to make the turn? So it, whatever uh, 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 flight controller you're using. Uh, like a spoiler or aileron? Or no, so it's an aileron. It's an aileron. But when you deflect the ailerons, you actually get proverse yaw, not adverse yaw. So it's... Uh, in this wing. In this wing. Proverse. Proverse yaw. Is that the absence of adverse or the opposite, as it implies, uh, of adverse? It's 
complex, but you, you actually get uh, a thrust component uh, on your up wiper. Uh, so you'll be hearing more about this. This is very, very new research that's uh, going on, but a significant part of uh, what NASA Armstrong at Edwards Air Force Base is focused on. Go. So you're saying there's no camber to those wings? Uh, there is camber to the wings. Sort of like the, the old T-38. Uh, you're not having to think about that. But no, 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 no. It's lots of camber on this one. Oh, lots of camber. Yeah. But it has to do with the uh, uh, wing twist, uh, and it's actually, instead of an elliptical lift profile, it's a bell curve. Uh, and it's exactly what every uh, long range flying anything in nature has this exact same wing, which is again, different than every aircraft that's ever been designed. There's actually one guy who designed a glider uh, using this concept, uh, but there were only 10 of them made and it never really caught on. And he really didn't know why it was working the way it was, uh, but obviously NASA does. And the difference in range between a conventionally built and, and this wing design is about 18% increase in range. And you can understand from that perspective, every airliner, every, I mean, this would be the baseline of how wings are uh, created. So the biggest factor is, is uh, the diminishing of the normal amount of drag. If you can see the wingtip vortices are actually happening at 70%. Not at the tip. Nope. So it's a, it's a completely different kind of wing concept from that perspective, but you'll be hearing more about that. Uh, and to finish up real quick, uh, some of our recent kind of activities, because obviously UAS is just to give an example of what this kind of brings uh, to the table. Uh, uh, from a kind of research perspective, uh, this was actually a five mile uh, area up in Bruno, Idaho, that your tax dollars uh, pay seven biologists to take care of this endangered snail called the Bruno River snail. And the only place in the world that it lives is this five mile stretch of river. And it only lives in these thermal vents. So you see, uh, it's kind of like Yellowstone where you got the warm water coming up. Uh, and in the past, they had done this with manned aircraft to map out where all these thermal vents are so they can go take care of these snails and give them lettuce or whatever they do. Uh, uh, but seven biologists, their entire job in life is to take care of these snails. We end up flying the same and doing these, uh, 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 geolocating all these. And, and they went from about 70 thermal vents that they knew in this five mile stretch to about 280 because of the resolution using the exact same sensor that we were using on manned aircraft, now down at, instead of 3,000 feet, down at 300 feet, uh, you've never seen seven more excited biologists because they, they had 200 more places to, uh, to uh, give lettuce to. Uh, this is some of the stuff from Department of Agriculture. This map here on the left is Riesel, Texas. Uh, this is kind of Google Maps on steroids. Uh, it represents the amount of chlorophyll in every leaf. Uh, uh, but that map, you can zoom in all the way to an individual leaf on an individual plant or zoom out to 1,100 acres. Uh, that, from a research standpoint, on the right is out in Davis, California, where they took uh, nine different rootstocks of walnut trees uh, have at that one facility, that's where they introduce disease to the plants to see which plants fight off that disease better than others. Uh, in the past, it all had been qualitative research. Now, for the first time, it's all quantitative that they can compare month to month, uh, 9 a.m. to, because all this is obviously reflected uh, infrared energy. 
uh, is how to determine how much chlorophyll down on each plant now healthy every plant is uh, so this is now a fundamental <coughs> change in how Department of Agriculture uh, does their research and finally from uh, what you'll start to see in this local community from a uh, engineering standpoint uh, creating topographic maps or uh, 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 doing surveying for uh, certain construction. Uh, there's an area, in fact, that area on the left was up uh, on the Franklin Mountains on the west side of El Paso. Uh, they spent uh, uh, six surveyors, professional surveyors. Uh, took them about seven days to drop uh, uh, 600 different points to create the topographic map. Same uh, 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 accuracy antenna on a UAS, uh, we dropped 4 million in 25 minutes. That's the fundamental change of what this technology brings and why in five years there will never be an engineering firm uh, that doesn't use this type of technology to do this exact same survey grade accuracy uh, type of data collections but for very, very large areas and for much less expensive than is currently done. A lot of information, but that's kind of an update of what's going on here in this local community. Not manned aviation, uh, and I know most everyone here is very enthusiastic about manned aviation, but it's kind of interesting from the former Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Wilson, uh, uh, coming in who's got the pulse on where aviation is going uh, at least from the military side and from her perspective everything is on this fairly significant shift uh, uh, from the kind of man to the unman and we're now at the beginning of this we're kind of PC computers of uh, 1990 but we're already there any questions? Sir. Mike, early on you mentioned that I'm not sure I caught it. Was it only 20% of these drone flights are legal? 20% are actually registering their uh, Going drones. Going the trouble of... So, per Part 48, uh, anything above 0.55 pounds that flies in the United States must be registered with the FAA. That goes across everything that flies. And they, they, they're comparing sales figures, I take it, and the commercial industry peddling all these drones, right. and then only 20% are registered. If you compare sales in the U.S. versus how many register with the FAA, that's about 20%. Oh, my God. And that's already at 1.5 million. Wow. Yeah. I can gather they're looking at uh, EW solutions, electronic warfare solutions for either protect or attack for these things. Absolutely. So there are a bunch of efforts uh, on that. Exactly. That is a key, key piece of protecting the national airspace. Yes, sir. I've got a couple of questions. Go. Uh, the one vehicle you said uh, go from here up to uh, Colorado, right. that's about a 300 mile range. What, what type of power? Uh, so that is gas power. Gas power. Uh, What's going on with the uh, the UAV facility that was up in uh, LRU uh, Las Cruces? Uh, so they are so up in Las Cruces. That is a uh, FAA test center. So they schedule so companies can come there. There's seven of those across the country. Uh -huh. Companies like Google, uh, if they want to use a restricted airspace there, then they schedule that through. Uh, 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 that facility. Okay, and, and lastly, about how many uh, unmanned vehicles are flying around this area and about what altitudes are they running? They're uh, a, a number, day. number one, a veritable crap load. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, they're all up to 1,600 feet. Legally, they're only allowed to go up to 400 feet and that is in class G, as you get around the airport, they can't fly at all. Does that stop anyone? Absolutely not. And so that's why the concerted effort 
to start uh, the enforcement. Uh, the FAA, interestingly, uh, has not has done little to no enforcement because they are uh, uh, they are manned and they are funded to do the surveillance for manned aircraft. That funding has not changed, and they just got. 1.5 million new aircraft dumped on them with no increase in funding. So from their perspective, they are, we are maxed out doing the surveillance on the manned aircraft programs, and that's part 121, 135, and all the rest. Uh, they don't have the resources to do any of this from the unmanned. So it's typically other federal agencies that are doing those type of activities. Sir. Mike, on that flight of the drone from here to Colorado that he mentioned also, what was the cruise speed on that machine? So, make sure there's no confusion. Uh, right now, uh, so it didn't, it has a capability to do that, and it's flown in a pattern for that long, but it actually didn't do that. That's illegal. Uh, right now, for UASs, <laughs> uh, all of that flight has to be done within visual range. So it's very, very short range. And that's why Amazon right now is not doing any delivering. But Amazon, UPS, FedEx are all cocked in full afterburner that uh, they're trying to open up the airspace to do uh, all of their uh, significant part of uh, what they deliver with unmanned systems because it is so much cheaper than a human being driving a truck and going to a location. Amazon is looking at upwards of, and most of you probably use Amazon Prime, 90% of everything that they deliver, that's their goal, being with the UASs. Amazon is no kidding full in, and they are lobbying heavy to open up the airspace to be able to do all this stuff autonomously. Amazon already has full warehouses not a single human being in there. So it is all robots. The order comes in, the robot goes, gets the piece, puts it in the box, it gets labeled, kind of everything else. Interestingly, we have a big study going on at RAND this fiscal year of what does our society look like 20 years from now when there are no jobs at McDonald's, there are no warehouse jobs, there are no trucking jobs. And that, from a societal standpoint, is a big, big concern that, that you have a significant number of, or percentage of jobs in the U.S. that end up being disappearing. And so what does society do if 30% of your population doesn't have a job? The Industrial Revolution, uh, all over backwards. So the, that there's a lot of effort of trying to figure out what that looks like uh, and that's going to happen much sooner than I think all of us can get our craniums around uh, and that's already happening in areas uh, and some of the first will be in the transportation area. What kind of safety parameters are they looking at? You look at Amazon and in any given day, you're going to see a UPS or a FedEx truck going by your house somewhere down that time. What's going to happen now, instead of that truck being out there, we got a little zip coming by, and all of a sudden, the electrons quit holding hands? Great, great question. So, uh, uh, there are a lot of different, uh, one of the main is automatic parachutes. Uh, One of the federal regulations that we see broken all the time is it is illegal to fly a drone over a single human being that's not participating, not the pilot or the visual observer or whatever. Uh, that's illegal. We see that broken every single day. Uh, and for that exact reason, because these falling, especially the big ones, you know, uh, 20 pound or 30 pound, falling from 400 feet, it will kill someone if it hits them. Uh, that's why the regulation is set. Uh, we are, UTEP is actually, I didn't talk about this, but one of the three universities in the entire country that has the authorization 
to fly over non-participating human beings. We will pretty soon be El Paso Police, El Paso Fire Department, because we all work together and we're sharing that exemption. Uh, that has a automatic parachute. Uh, and a lot of studying uh, under that parachute, uh, what are the uh, probabilities of someone getting injured if that thing uh, hits, what is the reliability of the parachute, and the FAA has signed off on uh, uh, that the risk is so minimal that you're now allowed to do that. But we're one of three universities in the entire country that have that. But that is that same uh, uh, safety methodology uh, that is being applied. And on top of that, um, from an engine standpoint, if you look at the Google or Amazon, uh, both of their systems, in fact, Google just did one of the first deliveries for CVS about a month ago, uh, that has uh, eight engines. So it has a capability to lose an engine and still land at a predetermined safe spot that are all programmed in that if this happens, then you get to the spot and go down, and if you can't, then you pop the parachute. But so that is a big, big concern. Sounds like these people are not familiar with the five for electron theory. Uh, so <laughs> on the other side is that cybersecurity piece. Uh, and uh, if you're trying to do bad, uh, then it's pretty easy to do bad. We do a lot of work with uh, up at Whisper because the, the main place that they do counter UAS work for Department of Defense is right up the road. Uh, and uh, you use a kind of directed energy uh, and it has a capability to screw up not only unmanned but manned also. Uh, and uh, especially when you talk about all the very new, so the new fighter aircraft, and it started with the F-16 and has been through the F-22, F-35, if you lose your flight control computers, uh, obviously you've got backup electronics, so if your generators go out, you have another system that provides ele electricity to that, but if those computers go out, that aircraft is unflyable. A human being cannot fly that aircraft because it is so unstable uh, and the distance between your brain and uh, your nerve to your muscle to go, it's pitching up, I need to push down, that right there is too long for your brain to decide you to command your muscle and make that movement, it's already gone out of control. That's why you have to fly those with flight control computers. Uh, those are also susceptible as we start to move into this uh, directed energy. Uh, and so there's, it's a scary new world. Uh, but from a, the side of UPS and FedEx and Amazon, there's a lot of concerns of what if these things start falling out of the sky and noise pollution and kind of everything else. Yes, sir. Is your, is your old Viper uh, that much fly-by-wire that if the computer's out, you're... It's uncontrollable. Really? So you have four flight control computers. They're all voting. When you say, in fact, your stick is not connected to anything. In fact, the first F-16s, the stick didn't move. And the pilots go, that screwing me up. Loosen the bolt. And they, no kidding, loosen the bolt so the stick would move a little bit. But they're just piezometric uh, sensors that look at how much force you're putting on that stick. That goes to a flight control computer to go, I want to roll this fast or this fast. And then the flight control computer takes all the inputs and figures out what to do with the control surfaces to do that. But you have no connection. You're just saying, how much, if it's a lot, then I want to roll real fast. If it's a little, I want to roll real slow. Those four control, flight control computers always come up with the solution. If one of them is uh, smoking something it shouldn't be smoking uh, and starts to come up with weird answers, the three gang up and kick him out. And then it's down to three. And then if one of those three start giving wrong answers, the two gang up and kick that one out. And it's never gotten beyond that. Uh, but if you're in your, uh, your bold face, if they all go out, it's, it's one step, a jet. 
but all of modern are that way. Well, the S16 is the first one to be so totally dependent because the others are more hybrid, weren't they? That was the first one and then everything since. But a lot of airliners now, uh, because as you bring that center of gravity back towards that center of lift, what happens, you have less tail downforce, which means it's much more efficient. So airliners are even, for efficiency's sake, trying to decrease that delta between where the center of gravity and the center of lift is, or center of pressure, so that tail downforce can be minimized, uh, because that tail downforce, you've got to create lift uh, not only for the weight of the aircraft, but to counteract that tail downforce. So they're engineering for instability again. They're engineering uh, to make sure that they have some, obviously you want statically stable, but, but just a little dynamically stable, but just a little. Uh, <laughs> just the opposite of the old days. Exactly, huh. exactly. Because that's fuel efficiency and that's more profitable. Sir, the, you're talking about directed energy, is that the same as EMT? So it is exactly the same. So you do, that's a, lasers fall under that, high power microwave falls under that, uh, EMP all in that same badness, bad electrons, lots of bad electrons. It only takes one. Yeah, yeah that's exactly <laughs> correct. Bad actor. So I thank you very, very much.